Few people in history have had the prestige to have entire epics named after them. Queen Victoria occupies a central position in this upper echelon of rulers. Since the Middle Ages, the British have occupied a central position in not just the history of Europe, but the history of the world. It was not unusual for the trends in Britain to dictate the cultural and social landscape in their colonies. An earlier example of this was the overseas exploration carried out under the rule of Queen Elizabeth, whose name inspired an entire epic as well, the Elizabethan era. So, it seems obvious that any era of the colonial times with strong distinctions would be remembered by the ruler that caused them. Such is the case with Queen Victoria. Since it has pleased Providence to place me in this station, I shall do my utmost to fulfill my duty towards my country. I am very young and perhaps in many, though not all things, inexperienced, but I am sure that very few have more real goodwill and more real desire to do what is fit and right than I have. Queen Victoria On May 24, 1819, Victoria was born to her father, Prince Edward, and her mother, Princess Victoria of saxe coburg saalfeld Edward's wife, Victoria, had previously been married to a German prince named Emmett Karl, Prince of Leningen. She had two children with Karl, a boy named Karl and a girl named Theodora. Before Emmett abruptly passed away in 1814, the newborn Victoria would take her name from her mother. However, her name is actually Alexandrina Victoria. Alexandrina was given to her in honor of one of the most powerful monarchs of the time, Tsar Alexander I of Russia. After the death of her grandfather, King George III, George IV came into power. His brother, William IV, took the throne next, but since he lacked a legitimate heir, Victoria was the only potential future heir to the throne. The British public had a fondness for female monarchs, as exemplified by the reign of Elizabeth I two centuries prior. After the death of her father, Prince Edward, she was dependent on her surviving parent, Princess Victoria of saxe coburg saalfeld Since she was German, there was a speculation about a return to her homeland after the death of her English husband. However, Victoria of saxe coburg saalfelds brother, the German Prince Leopold, told her that she should bring up her daughter and namesake, Victoria, in Britain, because a queen who has grown up in another country will never hold the hearts of the people. And so, the little girl was brought up in Britain with help from her uncle. In later life, Queen Victoria would come to look at this period of her life with grave interest, quipping, the greatest maxim of all is that children should be brought up as simply and in as domestic a way as possible, and that they should be as much as possible with their parents and learn to place the greatest confidence in them in all things. Little Victoria was brought up in an academic environment. She learned the alphabet rather quickly and developed other sensitivities of the refined life, but her newfound honesty blossomed into a candid nature that she would retain for the rest of her life. She was most undoubtedly frank with her children. G. M. Trevelyan, an English historian, claimed, Enlarged sympathy with children was one of the chief contributions made by the Victorian English to real civilization. However, from an early age, she was a quick learner and an overachiever. She developed a preference for being called Victoria over being called Alexandrina. Victoria was an unusual name in England at the time, and her mother worried about her coming off as a usurper. Ironically, she not only introduced the English to this new name, but popularized it to the point where it now has a quintessentially British feel. Victoria was groomed for the throne from an early age, but her mother restricted her from making frequent court appearances, despite the insistence from King William IV, the successor to his elder brother, King George IV. She did not want the young girl to get caught up in court intrigue. In the years leading up to Queen Victoria's ascent to the throne, her mother and attendants did everything they could to make sure that she was ready for her ordained role. As a part of this preparation, they took Victoria on an extensive trip to oversee the land that she would be ruling. Of course, she did not get to travel the full extent of the British domain, but she did get to see most of England. She traveled throughout the countryside on various vacation days set aside for her. Her destiny was sealed on May 24, 1837, when she turned 18. The following month, on June 20th, King William IV passed away, allowing Victoria to become queen immediately without the need of an official regency. Queen Victoria was officially declared Queen of the Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, Defender of the Faith. On June 28, 1838, about one year after Victoria had become queen, her official coronation was held. Although she had been queen for almost a year, 
The coronation could not take place until a respectable amount of time had passed since the death of the last monarch, as a coronation is perceived as a joyous affair. At first hesitant to leave Kensington Gardens to arrive at Buckingham Palace, she quickly took to it, describing her throne there as the most comfortable throne I have ever sat on. Every morning she would meet with her Prime Minister, Lord Melbourne, to discuss the important matters of state. With him, she discussed issues of grave importance on the world stage and domestic front. At the end of the day, her appointed ministers needed her signature to move their directives forward, but Victoria could not be a distant ruler. Early on, she proved to her advisors that she desired to be right in the thick of things. Instead of just rubber stamping whatever British Parliament came up with, she would thoroughly consider what was being suggested. Queen Victoria wisely chose to educate herself on all legislation making its way to her. As a result, she was often hit with a deluge of paperwork, which took up nearly all of her time just to go through. Most of her close acquaintances at the time began to wonder if perhaps some party members had been purposely trying to overwhelm the Queen so that she would eventually give up her hands-on approach and begin to give her automatic approval to whatever legislation they pushed forward. Prime Minister Melbourne took the new Queen under his political wings and helped to show her the ropes along the way. They soon became remarkably close, and Victoria would later recall developing a kind of love for the man. Love, of course, was meant strictly in the fatherly sense of the word. Her reliance on Prime Minister Melbourne, close advisors like Baron Stockmar, and the ladies of her household meant that the bedchamber plot tested her resolve. As you might have guessed, this event was named such because the colossal reversal of parliamentary affairs was rooted in the fact that the Queen simply did not wish to have to hire new help for her bedchamber. Yes, it certainly didn't look good for the 19-year-old Queen to create paralysis in British governance, merely because she didn't want to part with her favorite chambermaids. However, she was a young Queen, fearful of becoming increasingly isolated. The situation was indeed distressing, and soon the chaos that had unfolded reached the attention of Victoria's uncle, King Leopold I of Belgium. Leopold, wishing to help ease Victoria's feelings of isolation, had Prince Albert, her first cousin, visit her. Leopold did not just want Albert to engage in a friendly chat with Victoria, he was looking to have the two marry, which they did. Soon after this private proclamation on January 16, 1840, the Queen publicly affirmed her intentions by declaring to the British Parliament that she and Albert had become engaged to be married. The marriage itself would take place on February 10, 1840. Nine months after their marriage, Victoria gave birth to the first of many children. The security of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert soon became a concern. A few weeks after their marriage, a man opened fire on their carriage. His aim was off, and the monarch remained unharmed, even if only physically. There would be subsequent attempts on her life, but fate always favored Victoria. There was also trouble in the household, as Albert and Victoria were at odds over their child's treatment. From that point onward, Albert gained more authority and even started participating in more civil and social activities than he had ever done before. Meanwhile, the Queen gave birth a few more times. Altogether, the Queen gave birth to nine children, five girls and four boys. During these years, there was a famine in Ireland, which the monarch did not handle well. Trouble was brewing for the Habsburg dynasty and Russian monarchy. Revolutionary movements in Italian, Austrian, and German regions fueled the uncertainty of the time. In 1853, the Crimean War erupted as well. By 1855, the Crimean War was undoubtedly taking its toll on the British, and the impact was most certainly felt by Queen Victoria. During this time, she gave a moving speech before Parliament in which tears could be seen welling up in her eyes. When that ordeal was over, the Indian Rebellion popped up in British India, and the death of her mother in 1861 did not help alleviate the situation, forcing the British monarch to unravel, often at the expense of her duties. In the same year, she would also lose her husband. The years passed as Victoria entered the later stages of her life as a widow. The Queen celebrated her Golden Jubilee in 1887 and her Diamond Jubilee in 1897. Such longevity among monarchs was a rare feat, and shortly after the outbreak of the Second Boer War, she passed away on January 22, 1901. Queen Victoria left a lasting imprint on the world during her life and reign, which stretched from the early 1800s to the dawn of the 1900s, known as the Victorian era. Even houses are named after the monarch. If you walk around the United Kingdom or any of its former colonies, 
you are bound to come across buildings that are described as Victorian. Victorian architecture stands as a testament to the impact of the Victorian era. Inventions like photography, the telegraph, and trains emerged during this era. Granted, these things may not seem as exceptional as the internet, hypersonic plates, or even the multimedia of today. But imagine a time when people communicated through letters, moved around in carriages, and had not been introduced to Impressionism or its derivatives. Considering the period, these were unparalleled and astonishing achievements. When she was born in 1819, the muscles of a horse's leg and the endurance of the beast's lungs dictated how fast and how far anyone could go. By the end of her era, people were traveling across steel rails at almost 80 miles an hour, sustained not by horses, but by the coal-fed engine of a locomotive. Breaking news could be printed on newspapers that could be distributed far and wide. With all these changes, people began questioning the older forms of governance and wanted a newer form of representation. The monarchy's power had been in a steady decline for a while, but the rule of Victoria instilled the British people with pride in this institution. One could argue that the current British regard for their monarchy can be traced back to none other than Queen Victoria. To learn more about the life of Queen Victoria, check out our book, Queen Victoria, a captivating guide to the Queen of the United Kingdoms of Great Britain and Ireland, along with her impact on the Victorian era. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Also, grab your free mythology bundle ebook while they're still available. All links are in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.